We're here with Moises Naim of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace to talk about his new book, The End of Power. And we're on the set of his show, Effecto Naim, and we're delighted that we have a chance to speak with him. Uh, thank you so much for, for taking this opportunity to speak with the National Endowment for Democracy's International Forum for Democratic Studies. Delighted to be with you. Thank you. Uh, you raise a number of very um, important questions connected to the global changes that are underway. Uh, one of the issues that you cite is the unprecedented evolution of democratic uh, states over the third wave of democracy, uh, which has led to the most democratic uh, landscape uh, the world has known. Um, in the last 10 years, however, uh, we've seen uh, some authoritarian uh, resilience, and we've seen what Larry Diamond, the democracy scholar, calls a democratic recession. What do you see as the um, key challenge that's coming from the authoritarians, and how might the decay of power influence their, uh, their, their condition? Both trends are true. Uh, we have now more democracies than ever before, but it's also true that we have seen reversals. We have seen countries that were democratic and are no longer democratic. We have seen countries where the democratic they continue to have elections and have some competitive uh, democratic system, but where the practices of democracy, where the, uh, the government abuses the power of incumbency in, in elections and violates uh, constitutions, we have seen all of that at the same time. Uh, but the trend seems to be pointing in a very clear direction. Life these days is not that comfortable for authoritarian regimes. How to explain otherwise why governments like uh, the Russian government, for example, uh, goes to those lengths to appear democratic and they have elections and they have a rotation between the president and the prime minister and they have all kinds of uh, democratic uh, looking and democratic sounding uh, measures when in fact everyone knows that President Putin uh, runs the show. Why doesn't President Putin just say, you know, I'm it, I'm, 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 there's no need for elections here, let's, let's just uh, stop uh, playing games uh, and, and, and declare himself as the ruler uh, of Russia. He doesn't do that. Uh, and so I think that may be dismissed as an anecdotal example, but I think that that's an example that embodies uh, uh, how difficult it is not to have the legitimacy, not to have the imprint of being a democracy. The, le the legitimacy in today's world uh, as a democracy seems to be very important. In, in terms of the uh, fragmentation and the erosion and decay of power, do you see uh, these authoritarian states, which have demonstrated some resilience in the last decade or so against the wave of democracy that have preceded it, how do you see them faring in the, uh, in the near term, given these well, changes? Well, the fact is that the forces that I discuss in the book, the forces that make power easier to get, uh, harder to use, and uh, more fleeting, are evident everywhere. Look at, for example, what's happening with Burma. This was a very strong military junta that had ruled the country with an iron fist uh, and continues to do so. But now, all of a sudden, they have uh, this opening and they are trying to reach, to reach out and try to see how they can move and again uh, win the seal of good housekeeping for, uh, yeah. as a democracy around the world. Uh, but there is no doubt that these forces uh, are there, uh, that uh, power is now becoming much harder to, to retain and much uh, harder also, much, much more difficult uh, to wield uh, uh, in the same way that it was in the past. And, and in the uh, established democratic setting, you also talk about the role of uh, micro powers and mega players and how the micro powers are checking the scope of action of these larger established institutions. What do you see as the, the largest challenge for the quality of democracy within the democratic uh, world? I, it is evident that in a lot of democracies, uh, decisions, uh, policies are being watered down, are delayed, are you know, transformed in ways that don't make uh, 
them effective, uh, that they are actually don't manage to, to solve problems. We're seeing it in the European economic crisis, we are seeing in the healthcare for many years in the United States, we see it in gridlock uh, in the United States and everything uh, surrounding uh, something as basic, as fundamental for democracy, as uh, having a budget and having decisions about how to tax and spend. Well, the, the government seems unable, the state uh, seems unable to reach decisions and that is a global trend. And around the world, you see how voters are uh, preferring divided government. Uh, in 30 out of 34 of the uh, democracies, uh, members of the OECD, these are rich countries that are democracies, in the great majority of them, 30, the voters decided to give the executive, the prime minister, the president of the country, uh, to one party and uh, the parliament and the congress uh, to another, therefore creating a highly complicated, unwieldy uh, uh, situation in which they, got, they have to come up with very complex coalitions that delay decision making, that force uh, dilution of uh, the decisions uh, that uh, are really not effective at, at, at solving problems. So we see those trends around the world, gridlock, uh, delays, dilution of the of decisions and that is of course a problem to uh, for which um, the voters are now reacting and beca becoming frustrated disappointed so in some ways you have this paradox you have the resilient authoritarians mimicking the uh, behaviors of democracy while the democracies themselves have these challenges to the quality of governance how do you see the um, democracies meeting these challenges given the ongoing fragmentation and the ongoing uh, challenges to organized uh, decision making? With more democracy, with a deepening of democracy. What's happening is that a lot in these uh, regimes, in these democratic regimes, they are choking in checks and balances because of the lack of trust, because of the, all of the forces uh, that I discuss in the book because of the role of the media, NGOs, independent central banks, uh, the very powerful financial players, hedge funds, uh, NGOs of all kinds. Uh, uh, these governments have, have, have significantly constrained and are now, and the executive in many countries is just a hobble giant, uh, almost as Gulliver, tied down as a, by the thousands of Lilliputians with strings that, that, that paralyze what in effect is, is a, can be a strong government. I am not arguing uh, to, to restore power and unilateral autocratic power, but I do argue that uh, in a lot of democracies we are choking on checks and balances, more checks and not enough balances. Mm -hmm. And so there are things that will not undermine democracies uh, in a lot of these countries that actually will make the system and the process even more democratic. Uh, and uh, that if they are reformed. Take filibuster in the United States. It's a good example, it's a very, it's a paradigm where you know, one or two uh, uh, congressmen or senators can just block an entire, the functioning of an entire Congress or, or uh, of, of block the functioning of government. Uh, you know, if you find ways of, of, of uh, avoiding that, you're not undermining democracy, you're strengthening democracy. Well, finally, uh, last question. You note in the book that part of the current challenge is that there's so little consensus analytically about the changes that are taking place, and there's a need to think these through and uh, get a better grounding in what the main challenges are. Uh, given the limits on using a crystal ball, if you had to um, uh, think about and advise on the biggest implications of the changes that you depict in the end of power, say in the next decade, what would be the, the chief point or two that you would cite? I am expecting a wave of innovation in politics uh, in, in, in a scale that we have not seen before, in democratic politics. And that is just a result of the fact that if you see around, uh, we are surrounded by innovation. This has been a decade in which everything has changed, in which we know more than ever about uh, uh, our genetic uh, um, structures, about celestial bodies. We have discovered more celestial bodies in the last 10, 20 years than in the last 200 years. 
um, not to mention uh, innovations in information technology and internet, uh, companies that have transformed the way we shop, the way we date, the way we eat, the way we exercise, sleep, everything. Everything we do since we wake up in the morning until we go to bed at night has been transformed by innovation, except the way we govern ourselves. So that vacuum, that gap cannot be sustained, especially given um, the, the, the increased uh, frustration and the demand that better ways of governing, better ways of participation, better ways of uh, um, formulating policies and solutions that can only come from governments. The, the uproar is there. And I, I therefore expect that the combination of the need plus uh, the, this culture of innovation will merge and create political innovations of the kinds we have not seen in a long time. Thank you so much, Moises Naim. We've been discussing your book, The End of Power. Thank you very much.